Hi, everybody. How are you? Good. Fantastic. It's great uh, to see everybody here. Uh, my name is Todd Deary. I'm part of the uh, staff here at, at FIA. Um, welcome. This is the final uh, presentations of the Coward 8 Capstone Games. And so we're, uh, we're really excited um, about those. Um, just a, a few housekeeping items um, for you. Um, number one, if you um, have a cell phone um, or something that makes a noise, if you could um, put it on vibrate or, or whatever you're comfortable with, but something so it doesn't beep in the middle of a presentation. Appreciate it. Um, certainly easy. Um, second, if you are a uh, potential student, um, you're not part of the FIA family yet, um, and you would like a tour um, of the building, find out more about the program, those kind of things, please see either me after okay. this or Sarah, who's right in front of us, um, and we'll be happy to, to do that. So we'll be waiting around um, after this. So definitely find us um, if, uh, if you'd like to get more information. We'll be happy to, uh, to take care of you, okay? Um, another item um, is we have a long standing, as long standing as we can here, uh, which is about eight years or so, um, of uh, going out to happy hour or out somewhere afterwards and, uh, and celebrating. And so uh, everyone's invited to do that. We're gonna go out to Wild Sides Barbecue on Edgewater Drive in College Park. And we usually have some tasty beverages and food um, together and just sort of decompress after the semester ends. Not so you're the welcome. Parkway. Pardon? Remind them not the Thornton Parkway. Yeah, not the Thornton Park Wild Side. That That's not the, the, the College Park. There, oh. Yeah, don't, don't, be, uh, don't be fooled. So just, uh, just north of here. Um, another item uh, to note is that um, when the students present, um, we're going to have them present all three games. And then afterwards, if you want to come up and ask them uh, questions, um, that'd be great. But we're not going to do a Q&A you know, during, the, during the presentations or after the presentations of each game. We're going to try to keep these moving um, rather quickly. So if you do want to find out more about the process of the game or have some particular question, find our leads of each of the three games who you'll, you'll see shortly uh, because they'll be, uh, they'll be presenting here today. Okay? Our short agenda is going to, I'm going to introduce uh, Rick. Well, actually, look, before we do that, let's, let's find out sort of a little bit about who's, who's in the audience. So if you are... Uh, this is cohort eight, our class, our eighth class, we call it. Cohort is just a nerdy educational term for class, essentially. Um, if you're part of the incoming class at cohort nine, let's see your hand if you're here. Nine. <laughs> um, well, welcome, uh, welcome. If you uh, obviously we know we know cohort eight, we're, we're, we've seen enough of them already. Uh, just kidding. Just kidding. I'm just kidding. Can't get enough of you. Uh, cohort seven in the house. Yeah. So seven. Uh, six. Six. Yeah. Six. To get back. Oh, in the they could be in the overflow room. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right, exactly. They never liked you know, a lot of crowds. Uh, three? <laughs> Any threes in the house? Three, yeah. We, you know, we, three we didn't, you know, it's, it, the, the yeah. class has got a lot smaller. Statistically, it's going to be difficult. Our first class was uh, 12 people, so it's definitely difficult. Uh, twos. Any cohort twos? All right. And uh, cohort one. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> The blind leap. Uh, you look like eight years after. <laughs> 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 hey, uh, a reminder if you want uh, a, uh, a seat of your own, uh, there is an overflow room in the back and we're live streaming it out to there so you'll, uh, you'll get it on about a three second delay. Um, all my jokes are a lot better in the overflow room, I think. Um, <laughs> um, also, the, actually, JR told me there actually is drinks back there. I was kind of kidding, but they do have soda and water left over. And Rich is modeling one. Rich, can you model that drink for us? There you go. That's the, kind of, that's the type of drink that you'll get. So we literally have millions of people uh, checking in live over Ustream. Right, JT? The millions. Millions. <laughs> well, we probably have like a, thou a thousand, like a thousand over North America. Including Canada. It's mostly China. What if I expanded out? <laughs> do we have? Do we? Can I? Do I hear 50? Do we have 50? Sure. 50. All right, we have 50. We have 50. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to turn it over to Rick. Rick's going to give you a little uh, history of sort of how we got here and how these games uh, get developed. And he's going to turn it over uh, to the teams themselves. So welcome and thanks for coming.
Um, yeah, we see a lot of people here that uh, haven't been to FIA before, uh, of course a lot of industry people. Some of you don't know kind of uh, what this process is all about, so we're going to explain it really quick. Um, this process actually starts, uh, well this year it started in a, around October. Uh, pretty much everybody who sits in on the game design class is allowed to pitch a game, and then in December uh, we narrow those down. This year we had about 30 game pitches. Uh, we narrowed it down to 10 in November in a little cut down round, and then those 10 were narrowed down to 5. Those five games actually uh, started in the beginning of January. Uh, we put everybody in the cohort got assigned a team, and we we're very predatory. We try to make this just like the real world. So two of them got whacked at the end of February. And that brought us down to three. And those three are the games you're going to see today. Uh, I think uh, we've said it. You know, we, we seem to say it every year. Every year, the new cohort sets the bar higher than the cohort before. And uh, this year, I think all three games accomplished that. Uh, I'm really happy. Uh, this is probably the best trio of games I think we've ever seen at FIA. Uh, these teams got more out of the engines, more out of their time available. I saw great work ethic. I don't really think, I can't think of anybody who uh, I could say is dead weight. You know, in previous cohorts, there's always one or two outliers. This year, there just wasn't. There are three very different games. Uh, we have a mobile platform defense game. We have uh, uh, we have uh, uh, an educational game, and we got a story story driven game. All three of them are really just amazing. You guys, I think you're really going to be happy. Uh, I, I have to put make a special note to the pen team uh, because you know we all know I'm like a history fruitcake. I have like 600 history books at home. Last night I was reading uh, a history book from about 6 700 A.D. and as I'm reading this book. I'm going through, and they're talking about uh, people who are political dissenters in the Middle East. And they said, if you dissented with the common opinion of the rulers, you were typically defenestrated. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I said to myself, you I would not have known that word if it was not <laughs> Penn. <laughs> Penn has improved my life. Thumbs <laughs> <laughs> up for Penn. said, um, we're, we're going to keep these three back to back. We've decided to just make this all one big show. Uh, so no questions in between. If you have questions uh, for the individual teams, you can ask them afterwards. And I'm just going to leave it at that and let's get on the road. So Blake Battle, everybody. <laughs> Hey everybody, how's it going? Yay. Um, I just want to take a minute. My mom is watching from a museum in Chicago with my family now, from an iPad. Nice. <laughs> so serious talk now. So, Battle Fortress and Fortis was a concept that was founded from rigorous demographic research. <laughs> we found that giant tortoises, humanoid hyenas, and gnome cultures were prime for a business impact in the gaming industry. <laughs> and that is what we designed the game around. <laughs> That's a joke, not a lot of you left, but anyway. <laughs> Battle Fortress Tortoise actually just started with a name. Um, Gabe, I think the first time I heard Battle Fortress Tortoise was in September, and basically it was just a name, and Gabe would walk around the cohort and say, hey, what do you think about the name Battle Fortress Tortoise? And people immediately would be flooded with all these ideas about what the game Battle Fortress Tortoise would have in it. And so our game is really unique in that aspect that I feel, in a way, everyone in the cohort had an impact on what the game would ultimately become. And from there, Vincent Angarosa, who's actually an artist on the Plushy Night team, drew a concept work of what would become Argo, which would really spark the imagination of everyone. And so from that, we're going to show you a little bit of the trailer from the game.
excited when I see that trailer. <laughs> but anyway, a little bit about the story of Battle Fortress Tortoise. Why are these gnomes living on the back of the tortoise? Why are they riding a giant tortoise to a place called the Promised Land? And why are these hyenas trying to attack them? It's all very simple, you see. The hyenas want to eat the tortoise, and the gnomes want to protect the tortoise from the hyenas. They want to go to the Promised Land, because the tortoise and the gnomes both have something to gain from the Promised Land. The tortoise, all the female tortoises happen to be at the Promised Land. <laughs> so they are going there for safety from the hyenas and reproduction. <laughs> the gnomes currently live in the trees because of the hyena horde-ridden lands on the ground. And so they want to go to a place where they can again enjoy the wonders of living on the surface of the earth as opposed to in the trees, which I guess are also on the surface of the earth, but you get the idea. <laughs> so the promised land presents a world with unlimited resources, safety, and the most beautiful women in the world. <laughs> Just like Miss Shauna Adamson sitting over here in the audience. <laughs> so that's the story of Battle Fortress Tortoise. <laughs> Are we all calm down? <laughs> okay, so gameplay. What we wanted to accomplish in Battle Fortress Tortoise is we wanted to have a shooter, but we also wanted to have strategic and tactical elements, but we really wanted it to be easy to play. So in the trailer, you saw that we had a third person shooter. We were shooting hyenas on the back of the tortoise, but we also were controlling cannons on the tortoise at hyenas that were running toward the tortoise. And so the idea is, is if any hyenas get through, they climb aboard, they try to kill you, and they try to kill the tortoise. And so when we play the game, that's what's going on. And that's what we're gonna show you now, a demo of our wonderful game. <clears throat> Thank <laughs> you. 
Hold for the king! Hold them! They're a festive people.
just as we were on a journey war-torn with many, many problems as we developed the game. And so I kind of wanted to take a moment to share some of those moments with you guys because that's, that's a big part about of what game development is about. So for one, our art style. This is us around Vertical Slice, and this is us now. And um, around Vertical Slice, our art style really lacked definition. And after that, we completely recreated our art style for pretty much every single asset in the game. And that was a pretty big challenge. And so here you can see the Nomander, <coughs> you can see the Hyena, <coughs> and Argo. You can see that that painterly style is much more vivid and alive now than it was in the past. Um, this was actually the first screenshot of our characters in the game we ever saw. Max posted it on, our lead programmer posted it on Facebook at about 2 a.m. It was the first time we got to see our characters actually in the game. And um, this is pre-vertical slice. And then this, as, as you can see it now. This was actually what our game first looked like. Um, this is a flash prototype. It's our tortoise in the middle and our little hyenas. And uh, this picture was actually a little bit of foreshadowing to an issue we'd be dealing with the whole game. And that's, um, our game crashed flash, just as our game crashed UDK all the time. And so frame rate issues, we wanted to have a lot of hyenas. We wanted to have a lot of action. And so that was an issue we dealt with. So this is the game in its beginning. And then again, this bad vertical slice. And then as you saw now. So you can really see how the game developed there. Um, scale. So when I was put on this game and I talked to Gabe, to me it was kind of a tall order. But you know, not a big deal. We want to have a giant environment. 
want to have a giant tortoise in that environment. We want to put an environment on the back of that giant tortoise. And then we want to put characters in that environment. And we want to interact with all these different things. And so it's like, oh, not a big deal. We'll just put the hyenas on the ground and hyenas on the back of Argo. It didn't really work that way. When you put the hyenas on the ground, they were little, little specks compared to what they were. And so this is the scale relationship you can see between the nomander and the hyena on the back of Argo. This is the size of the hyenas that are on the ground. <laughs> and you take that up a step further, and that's the size of our orcas. And then here we have Argo. So you have these little bitty characters over here, all up on here. And then you take all of this, and you have one of the biggest maps that UDK can support. <laughs> Six miles long, three miles wide, and up here you can see Argo. And so we didn't have, earlier you saw a screenshot that said cannot build lighting. That was an issue pretty much the entire game because our computers start with four gigabytes of RAM and every time we tried to build lighting, our game would crash. So we spent long periods of time, the faculty being very critical of us of where's your lighting, we don't know what your game looks like. <laughs> so this little hyena here is affectionately named Atlas. And when we first, so Argo is a giant skeletal mesh, he's a character, and we have all of these other objects attached to him to create him. We couldn't figure out how to make everything work to attach to him to move at first. And so what we found is if we put a little skeletal mesh in the middle of Argo, we could attach everything to him, and then attach it to Argo, and everything would work. And so that's kind of a big spoiler, but at the center of every tortoise is a little high enough. <laughs> Actually, we figured that problem out, and we really just had to check a box somewhere. But in UDK, <laughs> in UDK there is like a million boxes. I saw some people from Nexus here. There's a lot of boxes. Isn't there Mr. Virgin? Yeah, lots of boxes. So um, at Vertical Slice, you know, I strolled in here bragging about how Argo is made up of 136 different objects. Um, that's a lot for a character, I think. But now Argo is made up of 2,282 different pieces that all march across that map. Pretty sure that's a world record. I'm going to claim it right now. BFT <laughs> has a world record for the most characters. So this was quite the moment on the project because we were posting these things everywhere because it was about three days before Vertical Slice and we could not get our hyenas to move on the back of Argo. So we have this game concept, we're going to come pitch it and be like, hey, we have this awesome game, the idea is going to work, but it doesn't work. And so the whole level is moving on the back of a giant creature, so there is some movement that has to be compensated for. Kind of an understatement. <laughs> so we got one reply to this. It's from Mr. Grey Lord. Also, movement and pathfinding don't go hand in hand. Thanks, Grey Lord. <laughs> so unless it's impossible to turn back, I would suggest to move the environment instead of the level to simulate it. Well, we definitely didn't have time to turn back. And even if we could have, we wouldn't have. And that's the message I kind of want to leave with everyone today, especially to the cohort niners. There's going to be a point in your project where this happens. It's going to be a challenge. And you're not going to know what to do. And it's going to be really scary. And you're going to be like, oh, should we change our game? Should we do something easier? What should we do? And the fact of the matter is, is moments like this are a blessing. Because when you see them, you know you're doing something right. Because we actually learned something. There wasn't anyone to tell us what to do. We had to write the book on how to make our game. And so when you reach moments like that, you'll find that you're truly making something unique. And you're truly learning something. And that's what FIA is all about. And that's what I want to leave you with. And so before you raise, before you clap, I want to ask everyone on BFT to stand up. And I want you to join me in applauding them, because they're the ones that deserve all the right <laughs> very much. That's all I have for you today. So I would like to introduce you to the wonderful, intelligent, beautiful, talented, luckiest man in the world's future wife, Alexis Didrolamy, to present that.